Good afternoon and welcome to the Downing Street Daily Coronavirus Briefing. Before taking questions from the public and from the media, um, I'd like to start by sharing the latest data. If we could have the first slide, please. The first slide shows the information on infections. And the data published by the Office for National Statistics this morning shows that the number of people who had coronavirus in England uh, fell from around 139,000 between the 3rd and 16th of May to around 53,000 between the 17th and 30th of May. And that's represented in percentage terms in this right-hand chart. And it demonstrates that the percentage of the population testing positive has been falling consistently over recent weeks. SAGE have confirmed that the R across the whole of the UK is between 0.7 and 0.9. And the Office for National Statistics survey also estimated the number of new coronavirus infections which stands at 39,000 per week, which is equivalent to around 5,600 per day. And this is lower than the similar estimate made last week. So these are encouraging trends about the reducing spread of coronavirus across the country. Next slide, please. This slide shows progress on testing and the number of new confirmed cases. In total, 5,200,000 tests have been carried out, including 207,231 tests yesterday. And these data on tests include both the swab tests to find out if you have coronavirus, and also the antibody tests which stand at around just over 40,000 antibody tests a day. The antibody tests find out if you have had the virus. And if you have had the virus, then you can help make a difference because by donating your plasma from your blood that has your antibodies in it, then you can help somebody who is currently suffering in hospital with coronavirus. I did this earlier today. I, I gave my antibodies, and the process is simple, it's straightforward. If you have had coronavirus, if you go to the NHS Blood and Transplant website, NHS BT, then you too can donate your antibodies and help protect somebody who's currently in hospital with coronavirus. And I'd encourage anybody who can do that to step forward. The chart also shows that the number of confirmed cases is 1,650 uh, yesterday, which brings the total number of confirmed cases confirmed by positive swab tests to 283,311. Next slide, please. This slide shows the data from hospitals. There were 694 admissions, new admissions, uh, with COVID-19 on the latest data, which has fallen over the last week. Those data uh, include England, Wales and Northern Ireland. They don't include Scotland. And also the, the bottom data, which is across the whole UK, shows the number of people in, men, in, in ventilator beds has fallen from 751 on the 28th of May, a week ago, down to 571. And this is down from a peak of over 3,000 on the 12th of April. Next slide, please. Slide four shows the regional breakdown of people in hospital. Uh, and it shows that over 7,000 people remain in hospital, 7,080 to be precise, but this is down 15% from 8,285 a week ago and a peak of over 20,000 in April. The final slide, next slide please, shows the number of people who have sadly lost their lives. And this number stands at 40,261 on the latest information, which is 357 higher than 
yesterday. And these slides demonstrate that although that the past few months have been a time of sorrow for so many people, because each of these deaths is not a statistic, but the loss of a loved one for so many families. The slides also show that we have made a progress in our fight against the virus, but they also show that there's so much more to do. Thank you. It shows that we must always remain vigilant, especially when it comes to protecting our NHS, which has been at the front line of the battle. And, of course, thanks to an enormous national effort, we protected the NHS and prevented it being overwhelmed, which in turn saved lives. And today I want to set out further steps that we're taking to protect the NHS, um, and especially around face coverings and face masks. Uh, yesterday, the Secretary of State for Transport announced that face coverings will become mandatory on public transport from the 15th of June, with a few specific exceptions, for instance, those with breathing difficulties. This doesn't mean surgical masks, which need to be kept for clinical settings, but the kind of face mask that you can easily make at home, and in fact there's a good guide on gov.uk. As more people go back to work and the passenger numbers start to increase, so face coverings on transport become more important. Likewise, as the NHS reopens right across the country, it's critically important to stop the spread amongst staff, patients and visitors too. So today we're setting out that all hospital visitors and outpatients will need to wear face coverings. One of the things that we've learned is that those in hospital, those who are working in hospital, are more likely uh, to catch coronavirus whether they work in a clinical setting or not. And so to offer even greater protection, we're also providing new guidance for NHS staff in England, which will come into force again on the 15th of June, and all hospital staff will be required to wear type 1 or 2 surgical masks, and this will cover all staff working in hospital. It will apply at all times, not just when they're doing the life-saving work on the front line. Uh, it will apply in all areas except those areas designated as COVID-secure workplaces. And of course, where the PPE guidance recommends more stringent protection, of course that remains in place. We're upgrading this guidance to make sure that even as the virus comes under control, and as we saw the falling incidents across the country, our hospitals are a place of care and of safety. We've also strengthened infection control in care homes, and we're working with the social care sector on how this approach can apply appropriately in social care too. It's about protecting the NHS and social care, which means protecting our colleagues who work in the NHS and in social care. And I want to say this to all my colleagues in health and social care. As we get this virus under control, it is so important that we stamp out new infections and outbreaks. And of course, in health and care, you do this brilliantly all the time, and coronavirus is no exception. That means that if one of your team tests positive, you have to follow the isolation advice. The natural impulse, of course, of anybody who works in care in the NHS is that the thing you can best do is be there to help, to be there for the patient. But, of course, if you have the virus or are at risk of having the virus, the best thing that you can do for them, as well as yourself, is to isolate at home. And this means that social distancing in the workplace also must be reiterated, and it matters just as much as anywhere else. And I know that social distancing and self-isolation can cause big logistical challenges, and we'll support you in doing what is right and necessary. All of us have a role to play here. And the last thing I want to say is this, that ahead of this weekend, when I know that there are plans for further uh, protests, I want to say something to you as Health Secretary. Like so many, I'm appalled by the death of George Floyd. 
And I understand why people are deeply upset. But we're still facing a health crisis and coronavirus remains a real threat. And the reason that it's vital that people stick to the rules this weekend is to protect themselves and their family from this horrific disease. So please, for the safety of your loved ones, do not attend large gatherings, including demonstrations of more than six people. We all need to stay alert, control the virus, and save lives. If we now go to questions, the first question is from Steve from Bath. Bank of England's bailout scheme has paid out 1.8 billion to airlines with no conditions on emissions or jobs. How do you square that with your promises of a green transport revolution? Well, thank you, Steve. I think one of the things we've seen during this uh, crisis uh, is that clearly the level of greenhouse gas emissions has fallen sharply. And that, of course, includes in airlines because the, the number of flights has fallen very, very sharply indeed. And I, I think it's very important that we hit that goal of net zero emissions that we've set as a country. We were the first country to set such an ambitious goal. Uh, but on our route there, of course, flying remains important, even though the number of flights has fallen. One of the good things amongst this terrible virus is that the amount of cycling has increased enormously uh, and more than doubled. So I think that we are making some progress in some areas um, and clearly the, the, uh, the lockdown has had a positive impact on reducing uh, carbon emissions. But we also do need an airline industry as we come out of this so that people can move about. And what we need is a long-term tra trajectory to getting to net zero that everybody can get behind. The next question is from Sam from Chester. And Sam from Chester asks, the likes of gardens and big shops are now beginning to reopen with social distancing measures in place. When will UK zoos be able to say the same? Um, and uh, Sam, thank you for your question. Uh, it's something that is close to my heart uh, because, uh, my, uh, uh, my <laughs> because Chester Zoo is such a fantastic zoo. And having, uh, coming from Chester myself, I know it extremely well. Um, and I really hope that we can open zoos in a safe way. Uh, and I know the pressure on zoos. I've, had, I've heard representations from, uh, uh, from those who are running zoos, um, not least because uh, unlike some other shops that can just close, you've still got to be there in the zoo looking after the animals, uh, and they are mostly outside. So uh, I, I, I very much hope that we can get the zoos reopened in a safe and COVID secure way. But of course, like all these things, it's got to be done in a way that doesn't allow the R to go above one uh, and doesn't allow the virus to get out of control. Thanks very much, Sam. Um, we'll now turn to questions from journalists. The first is from Hugh Pym on the, from the BBC. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I wanted to ask um, a couple of questions related uh, in one. First of all, the government's chief scientific advisor said keeping the death total to 20,000 or below would be a good outcome. It's now above 40,000. How do you assess that outcome given where we are now? And the other one was on the R number. There's been some modelling suggesting that regional variations, uh, certainly in England, are quite pronounced in the southwest and the northwest. It's estimated to be around one. Is that a concern? And might there be a case for more regional restrictions? Well, thank you, Hugh. I, I think uh, the day that um, the number of deaths from coronavirus has gone over 40,000 is a, a, a time of sorrow for us all. Uh, we've got to remember that each one of these is, 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 is an an impact on a family that will never be the same again. And my heart goes out to them all. And it makes me redouble my determination to deal with this virus 
and to get that incidence right down. And the way you get the incidence down, exactly as you say, it is the questions are absolutely linked, is to keep the R below 1. And we're increasingly getting better regional data. Um, you're right that the R is closer to 1 in the southwest and in the northwest. The advice from SAGE is that R is below 1 in all regions. However, we want to increasingly have a, uh, an approach of tackling local lockdowns where we spot a flare-up. We've been doing this uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, for instance, there was a flare-up in Western Supermare, which we successfully have got under control. Uh, and making sure that we use these, uh, these extra uh, focused data, both at a regional level and then more locally than that, is incredibly important. So the new Joint Biosecurity Centre has been tasked to look into each uh, area where there's a flare-up. You know, both the northwest and the southwest, which are highlighted by the regional data, are big areas themselves, and we need to get more granular and more focused and find the source of the local outbreak and then deal with it. A quick follow-up on another subject, if I may. Uh, Michel Barnier has said that trade talks between the EU and the UK are not progressing well. What are the chances, do you think, of a no deal? Uh, well, I very much hope that we avoid that because our position is very reasonable. Um, it's that any agreement we reach must reflect the fact that the UK is an independent sovereign state and we're working very hard and will accelerate the work to make progress in talks uh, by the end of the year uh, so that we can put into place the vision that has already been agreed between the UK and the EU, uh, which is based within the uh, political declaration. You know, I spend my, all my time uh, working on uh, coronavirus, uh, and I think that th given the time that's passed, it's time for both sides to work together, and we're willing to accelerate that work uh, to get that final agreement based on a vision that's been uh, agreed, and then we can progress. Thanks very much, Hugh. Um, Sam Coates from Sky. Sam. Secretary of State. Um, you seem to be uh, cherry-picking the most positive data, um, but doesn't that give an over-positive gloss to what's going on? Um, Public Health England, the body which reports to you, said today that the regional R number is rising in many places and is above one, not near to one, as you just said, but above one in some of them. A Cambridge University study, co-authored by your very own Public Health England, suggests that the reproduction number could be above one in Liverpool and Manchester. Um, now, this study from Cambridge and PHE says that the R number is rising, and I quote, probably due to increasing mobility and mixing between households and in public and workplace settings. Are they wrong? And would you tell the people of the Northwest and the Southwest this weekend to still exercise all of the new freedoms given to them by the Prime Minister this weekend, or should they exercise a little bit of extra caution? Well, I think everybody should exercise caution, Sam. I think that's an incredibly important part of what we all have to do at this point. Um, and uh, in a way, the, um, the discussion of the, uh, the higher R in the northwest and the southwest that's estimated uh, compared to the rest of the country it, it is, a, is an important part of moving towards a more localised approach rather than a national approach to the lockdown. Now, it's very important that you look at all of these different studies in the round. Uh, the study you mentioned is an important one, but the overall assessment, which is brought together by SAGE, uh, which advises the chief medical officer, um, is what I uh, look at. So we referred to the Office for National Statistics um, study that was published this morning on the slides. Uh, that, is, uh, that is based on data rather than modelling. But what I do is look at all of these different studies, and the overall view of SAGE is that the R is between 0.7 and 0.9, um, and that it is higher in the southwest of England and the northwest of England, um, but that it belows, b remains below uh, 1 in each area. Now, I'm, um, uh, th that doesn't take away from the need to make sure that we uh, that we spot and crack down on localised outbreaks when they come.
If you had to do tomorrow a local lockdown, is the infrastructure in place to make that happen? Uh, yes, and as I said in my answer to Hugh Pym, uh, we've been doing it over the past weeks, for instance, in Western Supermare. Thanks, Sam. Um, the next question is from uh, Shabab Khan from ITV. Shabab. Um, House Secretary, you've said that if the R number increases, we might have regional lockdowns. You've mentioned that in the previous two answers that you've given. Many people in those areas have no idea what a regional lockdown will look like. When can we expect the guidance on what that will actually be in practice? Also, are you talking to Metro mayors and local authorities in areas where the R rate is high about what they can do to protect their populations and how exactly they should be enforcing a regional lockdown? Uh, yes, these are really, really important subjects. Um, as part of the overall test and trace programme that Baroness Dido Harding is running, uh, we have as part of that the engagement through, in England, local authorities and uh, the regional uh, mayors, uh, and also, of course, with my colleagues in the devolved uh, countries, because the, uh, the PHE study, of course, is about England, um, and uh, the same localised, increasingly localised approach needs to be taken in, uh, in the devolved nations as well. Um, so those connections are made. Uh, and in fact, we brought in Tom Riordan, who's the chief executive of Leeds City Council, in order to ensure that we have that connection uh, between the measures that need to be taken at a local level and, of course, the national oversight of that. It's an incredibly important uh, system. Uh, it's already working, as I mentioned in my response to one of the first questions, um, but we're continuing to strengthen it and strengthen the data feeds so that we can get more and more localised information. Um, you, you've repeatedly said that easing the lockdown, and, and this is from the very beginning of this pandemic starting and you're talking about the next steps, is conditional on that R number. And the models that have, again have been mentioned by my colleagues suggest that there are regions that are close to or above one. So at what figure and at what point do you put the brakes on your plans to ease the lockdown? Is there a number at which you stop? proceeding with easing off these measures? Well, as I say, the, uh, the, all of the different studies are brought together through SAGE, whose assessment is that the overall UKR is between 0.7 and 0.9. And in a way, the question highlights the need to do that and to bring all of these studies together, because today we've had news from the Office of National Statistics uh, implying that the number of new cases is coming down and down to around 5,600 per day. Um, and then we've had other studies implying that it's higher than that. And what I do is listen to all of this advice and it, make sure that it's synthesized and then you get an overall view. What they do confirm across the board is that there is a challenge in the northwest of England that we need to address uh, and to a lesser degree in the southwest of England where the issue is slightly different, which is the, the, in the southwest, the overall incidence of the diseases is, is, is much lower, uh, but the R, as in the rate of change of that, um, is a little bit higher than elsewhere in, uh, in the UK. So the, the, exactly as, you, as is implied in your question, uh, you can't just look at one of these studies. You have to look at all of the information that you have in the round, and uh, SAGE advisors on that and the Joint Biosecurity Centre is in fact being built to ensure that we can bring all of that information together and then be advised how to act on it, whether that's at a national level through ministers or at a local level. Thanks very much, uh, Shabab. The next question is from Gordon Rayner from The Telegraph. Thank you, Secretary of State. Um, could you explain to people uh, what, if there is a different R rate in the community as opposed to in hospitals and care homes? Um, and also, why have you only just made face masks mandatory for hospital staff now? Uh, it seems like a fairly common sense uh, thing to do. Was it purely because of a lack of PPE before now? Well, the change that we've made in hospitals is about um, face masks for staff of face coverings um, for patients and as we bring the overall incidence of the disease down so we've got to make sure that we uh, cut out nosocomial infection as it's called that is infections that are uh, passed on when in hospital um, and on the uh, first part of your question 
uh, Gordon. The um, uh, the um, I've completely forgotten what the first the, part of the question was. The, the difference between the R rate and the community. Oh yes, of course, the they, were, they were linked. So the difference is um, in terms of the R rate. Um, that of course there are uh, there is a higher incidence of uh, new cases amongst um, health staff and social care staff. That is shown up in all of the studies. Um, but that is not rising uh, as a proportion. Um, and that implies that there isn't a different R, so to speak, in health and in social care. Uh, but the measures that you take in health, in the NHS and in social care are different. Hence, we have a whole package of work to uh, bear down on the uh, disease in social care, and at the same time, a huge package of work that's being undertaken by the NHS in order to get the uh, transmission of coronavirus in hospitals uh, right down. Uh, and it's that latter one that we're publishing more information on uh, and uh, where, we're, where we're strengthening the rules around face masks and face coverings in hospitals. Thanks, Gordon. Uh, Nigel Morris from the Eye. Um, Secretary of State, the Prime Minister has talked of a timetable of going easing the next phase of the lockdown from July the 4th onwards, which would cover hotels, restaurants, tourist attractions and so on. Isn't that now a completely unrealistic target, given the rates of infection and reproduction in, as we've talked about, the Northwest and the Southwest? And isn't the truth that the hope of a great British staycation are beginning to fade with these stubbornly high numbers. And on a second question, following your comments about this weekend's protests, would you be expecting the police to break up demonstrations of seven or more people? Uh, thanks, uh, Nigel. Um, the thing is, I, I, I can't do anything other than come back to what I said in response to earlier questions on the R. Um, it is, it is important that people don't seize on one report, but rather look at all the reports in the round. Uh, so it, it, the overall view of SAGE, having considered uh, all of the information that's come in, is that R, over the country as a whole, remains between 0.7 and 0.9. Um, and critically, the ONS study, which is one of the largest studies and is based on direct measurement rather than modelling, shows that the number of new cases per day is falling um, and has fallen from uh, between um, uh, nine and 7,000, as it was uh, thought to be around a week ago, to around 5,600. Um, the, so, so you've got to look at all of these things in the round, and that confirms that the R is at around remains at around 0.7 uh, to 0.9, and then we are seeking to take a more uh, local approach to, uh, to tackling outbreaks where we find them. On the second question, uh, that is very much an operational matter for the police. The final question is from Ahmed Versi from the Muslim News. Ahmed. Um, um, hi, Secretary of State. Um, uh, the Black, Asian, and Minority Ethnic Communities um, were disappointed with the uh, Public Health England's um, uh, review published a few days ago um, because the content of the review was nothing new. Um, what the ethnic community were promised uh, and had asked for was to find out why disproportionate number of ethnic communities are dying because of COVID-19. And they were expect also expecting the government to uh, put mitigation to protect the communities. Um, a month ago, I had asked uh, Cabinet Office Minister Michael Gove uh, that public health um, needs to look at and into the structural issues of racism and discrimination, which increase health risks in ethnic minorities. Mr. Gove did agree with me that the review should not only look at potential biological aspects, but he said, perhaps socioeconomic structural factors which may lead to inequality and that inequality may, uh, may have been as a result of discrimination. Yeah. However, what was promised by them was not, did not take place as, uh, as we can see. 
what is the reason behind that? And our readers are telling us that the government, it seems, does not care about ethnic minority deaths. And because the, um, the review confirms that. Well, um, thank you for your question, Ahmed. The, um, the last uh, comment uh, pains me because uh, I, we do uh, care deeply about this subject. Um, and um, the, th that's why f following the publication by Public Health England, we're taking forward the action and Kemi Badnock as the Minister for Equalities and I are working together to take forward this point of exactly why the information, including new information, it's not true that the Public Health England report was entirely uh, uh, information already available, um, but to take forward why um, and also what we can do about it. Now, many of the steps that uh, are implied, for instance, by socioeconomic factors, for instance, the higher likelihood, uh, the big, bigger number, proportion of uh, of people from black and minority ethnic backgrounds working in occupations that are uh, customer focused, for instance, in transport um, and, um, and also in the NHS, um, the, the, that may well be, uh, and I would say is likely to be, an important factor in answering this question that you rightly asked, which is why. And so the answer to that is to address the risks to those occupations um, and we're working very hard to do that. And in fact, the measure on uh, face masks, both on public transport and uh, in um, hospitals, uh, will be steps uh, in that journey. But we've absolutely picked up that PHE report, and within government, we will now be doing the, the next step in that work to address exactly the question that you quite rightly ask. I mean, can I come back, please? Yes, of course. Would you look at the structural issues, which um, Ms. Michael Gove did promise that um, the Public Health England would look at this review, but it didn't? Yeah, yes. Yes, absolutely. That, that's exactly what we'll be doing. And taking a rigorous scientific approach to trying to understand the root causes and the reasons why. Uh, in some cases, you know, the, the Public Health England report did not take in, factors into account such as comorbidities, or as I mentioned, uh, occupation. That's the first starting point. Uh, but also, you know, questions around deprivation, quality of housing are important as well, because we know uh, that it, the, uh, lo the, those living in lower quality housing uh, find it more difficult to escape from a contagious virus like this. So absolutely those questions uh, remain to be answered. So we're taking forward the PHE uh, work it's being done in government by the Government Equalities Office with all the support that they need from right across government, including my department. Uh, and uh, I very much hope we can get to the bottom of those questions. But, he, but all the way along, if we find things that we can do to help reduce these inequalities, then we'll just get on and do them. Thanks very much, Ahmed. And that concludes today's Downing Street Daily press conference.